Okay, so this is an extra lecture uh, to make sure that we fit in a little bit more about proofs from requests from the students. So this is about uh, chapter two, week two of the Domain Specific Languages of Mathematics course. You can see the, the front page of the book on the right and the logo. Um, and the book um, is also, the source code for the book is available on uh, GitHub. And I have now extracted the core code from chapter two into this file. And we'll talk through some parts of it and then focus on a few examples which were uh, pinpointed by students as confusing. So first of all, first of all this uh, lecture focuses completely on propositional logic. So uh, the data type for coding this up in Haskell here is prop. I should notice as uh, before, we coded up complex numbers, we called it up rational numbers, different things. Uh, this is not to say that this is the sort of perfect encoding and something industrial strength, but it's a way of making sense of the mathematical concepts and checking the scope, type, and semantics of the concepts we're learning about. Anyway, so the data type prop here for propositions includes the lo usual logic connectives like implication and or not. And then it has uh, variables, which we call here names as the leaves and also booleans. So you can say true or false at the bottom. Um, so these are syntax trees and the, to uh, interpret them, we need to translate from a prop to a boolean. And uh, so names here are just strings um, and we need to translate the names to truth and false. So given a mapping from names to Booleans, we can translate a prop to a Boolean. And the definition, which we did uh, half of it already in the other lecture, has here been completed. So an implication is translated to a recursive call to eval and then a Boolean implication operator. And similarly for and or not. So these are all uh, recursive calls to the syntax tree and then semantic operations, which will just then take two Booleans like this one, implication. False implies everything and true implies P if P is true. And then the last two cases, if we end up at a leaf with this, with this name or a, or a propositional variable, then we just look up that name in the environment, which here is implemented as a function type type n equals uh, not named to bool. And then finally, if we have a constant, uh, a true or a false, we don't need the environment and we just return that constant t. Okay, so that part was already covered earlier. Um, now to proofs. So here uh, we're trying to implement a data type uh, for representing proof objects. So something which is a evidence that some certain proposition is actually true. And um, we will now focus only on the first few constructors of this data type. The rest are also described in the book, but here we'll just focus on these. So it's for introducing an implication. Uh, we will not cover assume, but it's used for the implementation of the checker. And it's not allowed to be used by sort of a, to proof things uh, externally. And then introducing an AND and eliminating an AND. And I should say this is basically pairing. And this is basically first and second. So extracting the first part of a pair and the second part of a pair. But as you may notice, uh, it's not only that. There is actually a proposition argument here needed because we want to, uh, to check if the first component of a pair is a correct proof. We also need to know what the other component proof was. We'll see the example later. And then, as I mentioned, we will not cover the rest of the constructors here, but we'll move on and uh, scroll this one far up. And I will keep the data type of proofs by splitting this window. And focus on that part. Okay, similarly then, we can then implement a checker for proofs. 
So given a candidate proof and a proposition, we want to say yes or no, this is a correct proof. And here we can see a little bit what the meaning of the proofs and the propositions are. So the and introduction, as I mentioned, is about basically a pairing. If we introduce a, an and, so we want to prove a property of the shape and PQ, then to check if that's okay, then we have to have a proof T and proof U. And then we check that T is a proof of P and that U is a proof of Q. So they are sort of just matched up correspondingly. So these are recursive calls to check proof and then combination of the results. And here we can see what the extra proposition is used for. So in the and elimination case, to know if the first projection of a certain uh, proof is a uh, T is the, a, a pr correct proof of the proposition P, then we check if the T component is a proof of the whole um, and P and Q. And there we combine it with the rest here, the Q. So if we want to take the, the tuple or the pair T and project out the first component and check if that's correct, then we have to supply the other component so that we, the other proposition component so that we can check it later. And uh, similarly for and lim r, implication introduction here, that's an interesting case. So if we want to prove that P implies Q, so that if we assume P, then Q is true, then will you do that by having a syntax tree including a function? So imply intro here, if we move up to the data type declaration, you can see that this stores not a normal syntax tree, but actually a function from a syntax tree to a syntax tree. So this function is this function f. And to check if f actually is a proof of p implies q, we apply it to this constructor, this sort of uh, secret internal constructor, assume. So we remember that we assume p to hold, and then we apply the function f to get a proof of q, and we check if it actually is a proof of q. And if we recursively inside here somewhere end up at the, uh, checking the assumption, then we have to check that we assumed that, uh, that a certain property is true, uh, and we want to check that, yes, it's actually that property uh, that we assumed, which we ended up with. So we have to check that P is equal to P prime. Okay, and as, a, as before, the rest of this uh, check proof and the rest of the constructors of proof are not covered in this lecture. So I will again split the screen here and um, scroll down to focus on the rest. So let's try to make this visible. Yes. Okay. So uh, if we go over to the evaluator here and try to apply check proof to some example, I've got a theorem. Oh, so, so a theorem here is a prop. So for example, uh, con true. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, the theorem makes con true, but the proof should be something else. Uh, so uh, if, yeah, well, let, let's not take this example. Let's take the example I prepared instead. Uh, so slightly further down, we have three examples. First, giving, introducing some names. And then the first theorem is the simple implication that some uh, A implies itself. So let's, let's try to check this. So this check one is... Um, Check one is application, checking if PR1 is a proof of theorem one. Well, now theorem one is the implication, but this is not implemented yet. So we have to implement this. So what could it be? Well, as if this is an implication, we can see that the only case in the check proof which proves an implication is the imply intro. So we're forced here to use imply intro. And then we have to provide a function. 
So let's uh, just write the lambda expression. And this assumes some evidence for A, let's call that evidence X. And then it should return some evidence for Q, which here is the same A. So we can return the same evidence. So if we have evidence that A is true, then clearly we can use that evidence again. And now we can check. Um, and it says here true. So true means that it has gone through the syntax tree of the proof and compared it with according to these rules to the syntax tree of the proposition and it's satisfied that it holds. Okay, so this was a, a, a very simple implication. Let's extend it slightly to theorem two here. So first to check if this checker actually ever says no, because it said true here, let's, let's try to use the same uh, proof as before. So if you load this file, we'll see that it's, it's, uh, it's happy loading it. So it doesn't see type-wise that there is anything wrong. So we've coded up the proofs and the proposition, but we haven't, we can't, the type checker will not help us at this stage. But if we check, if you call the, the check proof, it will notice when it gets uh, further in that this X over here is actually not an evidence of an AND AA. Well, how do we provide evidence for the AND case? Well, we can see here, if we want to prove AND PQ, well, including P and Q being A, then we have to use AND intro. So let's do AND intro here. And then it's a question, what should the two arguments be? Well, the two arguments should be proofs of P and proofs of Q, where both P and Q are A. So the same evidence X we can now use twice. So let's see. Okay, so now I happen to, to type a, a little prime at the same time there. So check two, it says true. Okay. So we have now extended the, the proof from an implication of A to A to an implication of A to and AA, and used then two of the constructors of the data type of proofs. And then the third extension, uh, which is a little more interesting, it says that and is commutative. So it says that and AB implies and BA. And I will start from the same structure here and see where we end up. So first, just as a sanity check, um, if I check this one, okay, I'll need to reload it first. If I check this one, it says false. So the proof, which was okay before, is not okay here. Um, it has a little bit of the right shape though. Um, so what I need to prove on the right-hand side of the implication is an AND. So I will need to use an AND intro but X here is actually now not just a proof of A, but it's actually a proof of A and B. So I'll call that uh, X and Y. So it's sort of a proof of, a, it's sort of something pair-like. It's not really a pair in this setting, but it's uh, some evidence that X and Y is true. So we need to use these, uh, the AND intro will need two different terms. So one term here and another term there. And it will need to use the X and Y term in some way. And well, the way to use it is to eliminate, so to extract, to apply basically, as we said before, first or second. So let's try to figure out which one to use where. So we need to prove the B case first. So the B case is actually the second component corresponding to the Y here. So we should sort of write here second of X and Y, but X and Y is not a pair, so we can't apply second to it. So we'll have to use what corresponds to second, the AND elimination. So this is an AND elim R. And the AND elim R takes an argument, uh, one more argument, because it needs to keep track, it needs to store what the other part of the proof is. 
So if now this is the second component, we also have to store the first component, which is A. So let's see if this has, um, okay, couldn't match. Yeah, okay. So now I, I left the second argument here as a unit, which is not quite right. So I need to also type something very similar and elim left. So remember here, we need to prove A. A corresponds to the first component of this pair X and Y. So this should eliminate on the left of X and Y. And then we need to, to uh, store the other uh, part. So it is, here it says there are lots of holes we could fill in because it doesn't have the types. Uh, so it doesn't know which one to guess, but it's actually the, the B. So let's see what happens if we do check three and it says true. Okay, and now you might wonder what, what would have happened if we have done something wrong here? For example, if we would swap the left and right, or if we put A instead of B. So let's just make one of those changes. Let's put B there and then check three again. And then it says false. So it's really, um, it doesn't give any useful error messages. This is a very poor uh, environment for doing proofs, uh, but it actually does check that we're doing it according to the correct rules. It also says here, try to swap andelim L and andelim R in the above proof. So let's, let's try to take this one and uh, edit it slightly. So andelim L and andelim R. Then we can do a check three bad. Oh, yeah, that's false. And it's false in, in several ways now, you could say. Because also, if you do an andelim L of this pair, it's the B that's the other component, and this is the A, but it's not enough um, because it's it's just not going to be the right shape of the proof anyway. Whatever we do with andelim L on the left, because as we mentioned, in the proposition, it's the B, it's the the right component of the of the assumption here. That we need to get to. So we need to use LM and the LIM R here. Anyway, so this was an illustration of using the data type of proofs up here, the semantic function, which takes a proof and a proposition and checks if it's um, true or if it's correct proof or not, and giving examples of the use of introduction and elimination rules. So there is the next part um, in the book, which is actually covered in the lectures already, where we do this not using a data type proof, but actually using the Haskell type system. And that gives more feedback to the user. So that's probably to be preferred. But for symmetry and consistency with the rest of the book, we are trying to code up when we find a structure, for example, the structure of proof terms, we try to see how would we code it up in syntax and how would we provide a semantics for it. And that's what we will be doing here. Okay, that was all for this extra lecture. I hope it became a little more clear now. And as uh, before reading chapter two carefully and asking questions uh, is um, a good idea. <laughs>